And it was a, a horrible, very, very dangerous situation with drunk armed men with their fingers on the triggers that were very, very upset with me uh, for a very long time. That is one of the many incredible stories you'll hear in this special two-part episode with Torbjörn Pedersen, who is the first person ever to visit every country in the world in a single journey without flying. That means he never went home and he never got on a plane. And he thought it would take four years. It took 10. And at the time of recording this interview, he's still not home. I actually talked to him when he was on his way home. He's still waiting for a cargo ship. And you're going to hear all about his amazing adventures right now. So buckle up, strap in. Thanks for being here. And welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. You're listening to the Zero to Travel podcast, where we explore exciting travel-based work, lifestyle, and business opportunities, helping you to achieve your wildest travel dreams. And now your host, world wanderer and travel junkie, Jason Moore. Hey there, it's Jason with ZeroToTravel.com. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging out, letting me bring a little travel into your ears today. This is the show to help you travel the world on your terms to fill your life with as much travel as you desire, no matter what your situation or experience. Thank you so much for listening, for being a part of this community, and I am so excited to get you this episode. I had to rush it out to you because I read about Torbjörn's journey in the local paper here in Norway. And looking at the byline, I realized it was written by my friend Gunnar Garfors, who is a friend of the show, first person to travel to every country in the world twice. And so I asked Gunnar, hey, are you still with uh, Torbjörn? Can we talk to him? Can we get him on the show? Because this journey is so fresh, having just completed it, I wanted to see if he was willing to unpack some of the many lessons learned, some of the things that this journey taught him, the stories, and all the rest. And so he was kind enough to make an introduction. And that's how this episode came to be. And as I mentioned, he's still not home. He's trying to get home. And he hasn't been home for a decade. And you can only imagine how that would change and impact somebody's life. Imagine just taking off and not ever getting on a flight or going home for 10 years. That means you have to sort out all your visas on the ground. You have to keep going even when you want to give up. What kept him going? What drove him to undertake such an audacious journey in the first place? How has this adventure changed him? So many questions, and he was kind enough to just be open and honest and share the reality of this. And that is the beauty of these longer form conversations. We can really get into it. And I wanted to break it up into two. The second one will come out in just a couple days, so you won't have to wait too long. And as a companion piece, you can always go to onceuponasaga.dk. That's Thor's blog where he shares more about the journey. You'll see some of the logistics and the planning and how he mapped it out, how he tackled it, articles, and so on. So feel free to check that out. And stick around on the back end. I will share a challenge, one of the themes that popped out to me that may help you rethink the next thing you do in life. Stick around for that. Now, without further ado... Here's my conversation with Thor. I'll see you on the other side, my friend. I'm taking an exotic trip uh, this summer to Legoland. That's good. I used to work in Legoland. I was a pirate. Nice. Okay. May I, so I can tell my son that I talked to a, a real Legoland pirate today? Yeah, the best. The best Legoland pirate. That's how humble yeah. I am. The best. <laughs> <laughs> because, dude, that's going to be the highlight of this interview for my kids. You know, I'm going to be like, right. I talked to somebody that traveled to every country around the world without flying, and he was a pirate <laughs> at Legoland. And they're going to be like, pirate at Legoland. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've, I've done my stints in theme parks, too. I worked at Disney for a summer, do yeah, really? as a janitor, basically. Yeah. Ah, oh, as a janitor, even. <laughs> oh yeah, sweeping up the cigarette butts and all the dirt and the trash. A very, very glorious yeah. job. And then uh, keeping the place I, clean. Good stuff. Keeping the place clean, man. And then I was a security guard at, at another theme park. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, well, what's like, what's the oddest job you've ever had? I don't know if it's from your travels or from something else, but. The travel became the job itself. So, but but uh, ahead of that, I guess I, I worked for a temp team at one point, and uh, they they called 
for two of us. So another guy and I, we were brought out to this factory where they make cat food and uh, dog food. And what had happened was that the, the machine that cans the food had been set falsely. So it had added 0.02% or something like that. And the cans per design couldn't take that. So they had all of these cans that were ready to explode. And then they had all these cans that had exploded and there were maggots all over the place. So you're dealing with cat food, dog food and maggots and nobody wanted to touch that. So they called the temp team and there was this guy and I who were going through. So we were supposed to work out which cans were okay because they're not going to toss the lot. So, so we're picking out the, the okay cans. And we had one or two cans just by the touch. They exploded right in front of us. Oh my gosh. How old were you? I would have been around 20 or something like that. Yeah. So I had finished business school and uh, I'd done some military service and I just signed up to become a UN peacekeeper. And we were about to be deployed on a mission, but then there was like a six month waiting period. So instead of having us at the military base, they said, just go home. And if you want a second job, you can do that. You'll still get paid by the army, but you can make double pay if you go. So yeah, I worked for a temp team for a while. Well, I mean, I think you deserve double pay if you're dealing with maggots and blow- <laughs> cat feud blowing up in your face, right? I mean, that's... I had, I had strange <laughs> dreams the next night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, well, I should officially say Torbjorn Pedersen, welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. And, and I guess you go by Thor or Tor? Yeah, it really depends. I mean, the Francophone countries, they have a hard time with Thor. So they say Tor and the Anglophone countries, they recognize Thor from the Avengers. So they're happy with that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if I was pronouncing it in Danish, I would say Tor, right? Something like yeah, that. Yeah, we would say Tor, Tor. But uh, nobody calls me that in, in Denmark. Everyone calls me Torbjörn. Because I, I live in Norway. I, sp- I speak Norwegian. I mean, you could say a, a version of Norwegian, I guess my wife might say. I don't know. The Danes and the Norwegian can understand each other, but they don't necessarily speak the same language. Is that right? Yeah, it's something along the line. I mean, if, if we had a few beer, <laughs> the yeah. more beer you, you, you take in the better in terms of communication. But no, it's it's pretty much the same language, uh, Swedish, Norwegian, and Danish, but pronounced slightly weird depending on where you're from. So right. if there, you can have <laughs> the conversations, but there is a lot of, what did you say? And can you repeat that? And that kind of stuff going on. Right. So we generally switch to English. <laughs> Man, I appreciate your time. I know you're pretty fresh off this thing. And I, I actually, we got introduced through uh, Gunnar, who's a friend of the show, another, uh, the first guy to travel to every country in the world twice. And you are the first person to travel to every country in the world without flying. We should do some housekeeping around that just so people understand like the exact specifics of that goal. And then you've done been doing a lot of interviews. You're like fresh off this thing. And you're like, man, I haven't even had time to reflect on this. Like, that's actually my intention for this interview is to just kind of give you, like, let's just talk about some of the the, the things uh, in terms of like reflection as opposed to, I mean, I do want to get travel tips and things like that, but we'll save that for later. But I've had Graham Hughes on the show in the past. So I have, I have a show ah, already out there called stuff. Every Country in the World Without yeah. Flying. Yeah. And I'm just like, well, okay, now I'm confused and I don't really know how this works. And I just yeah. want you to kind of explain the every country's thing so we understand what you did (laughs) oh yeah 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 yeah. i appreciate the opportunity to do that sure i was actually inspired by graham hughes um and it it came about when my father he sent me a link so graham was all over media when he completed his odyssey and my father sent me a link and i read about it and it blew my mind i couldn't believe that no one had gone to every country without flying and Graham had done it, and I didn't know about it. Uh, so I read that article, and the article clearly said, man travels every country in the world without flying, first time, history, that kind of stuff. So, and, uh, and I did more and more research, and I was talking to my friends, and I was 34 years old, and most of my friends were about the same age and had their first child or second child, and I had a career, everyone had a career and a job and responsibilities. So, you know... I was the one who was <laughs> into this, not so much my friends. My friends were more like, yeah, okay, that's okay. That's all right. I have to go and pick up the kids. But I really got into it. And, and the more research I did, 
you know, it's sort of like one of those don't don't meet your heroes kind of things where the, the, the more I scratched the surface, I discovered that while while his achievements are absolutely amazing and I'm all inspired by by Graham Hughes and what he did and, and we speak about the world in much the same way and with the same kind of passion. I was surprised to find that that uh, he didn't do the first thing that came to my mind when I heard that someone had gone to every country without flying. So first of all, he flew a bunch within his project. And uh, he would always return to the same place and then continue traveling from, from that point. So he would say that the line is unbroken because he... He, he picks up where he, where he left off. But I would say that's flying, <laughs> you, know, you know? And when, when, when someone tells me they've gone to every country in the world without flying, then in my mind, they left home, they went to all the countries, they didn't fly at any point, and then they came back home. So within Graham's project, uh, he, he flew for some really good reasons. I mean, some really humane reasons uh, his sister got sick and he flew to be with his sister which is respectable but at the same time and, and this is i'm not going to sound like a very nice person when i say when i say this but but at the same time that's a decision and i would argue that he made the right decision to fly home to be with his sister but then beyond that to say that you did it without flying becomes problematic. But it also wasn't the only flying that, that Graham did. Graham, he flew on holiday to be with his uh, then girlfriend in Australia. And I believe he also applied for some visas when he was back home, where it was easier for him to get some of the visas so he could continue when he came back out into the world. And as such, I would argue that the flying becomes a part of the journey. First of all, he gets a break from wherever he was in the world but also that he might not have been able to come by those visas if he didn't fly back home. So there's that. Then Graham, he didn't. And this is not really where I default him because, you know, a second in a country is a visit to a country. You can, as a traveler, you can certainly debate what is the value in, in, in going to a country if you're only spending a few minutes or 10 minutes or half an hour or so. But, but in terms of achievement, that's definitely a visit. So I'm not faulting him on, on that at all. But it's just kind of also not what I imagined. When you hear that someone has gone to every country in the world, then it's not just setting foot on dry land. Certainly, you spent a night, you met some people, you had a meal, you, you came out of there with a story. And, and through that, I found that there were a number of countries where if he wanted to go inside, deeper inside the countries, he would have had to have the visa. But because he was doing a different thing than what, I, what I've done, he uh, didn't have to get the visa. He could just go up to the border, ask if he could stand on the other side of the line for a few seconds, take a GPS flight, make a, a, a little bit of video, and then return to his path. Uh, his visit to North Korea was going up to the DMZ and then basically walking around the negotiation table uh, where one side of the table is in North Korea and the other side is in South Korea. So it was, it was that kind of stuff. And then when I found out that what he had done, and again, I think it is an amazing accomplishment what he did. I mean, the man, he visited more than 100 countries within the first year. He visited seven countries in one day. <laughs> he, he filmed and edited all sorts of stuff as he went along. Uh, I, I think he's, he's amazing. But I don't think that he can claim he went to every country in the world without flying. And if he wants to do so, then he has to put some sort of caveat there. I mean, in the same way that if I want to say I went to every country in the world completely without flying, then he might have to say that he went to every country in the world without flying on a technicality. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I, I appreciate you painting the picture. And I, I know the I can hear the sensitivity there. And there's, of course, a mutual respect 
And I mean, you say on your on your website, Once Upon a Saga, which of course we're going to link up to all all of this stuff and and the resources we mention here. But you know, this is a one man journey to visit every country in the world in a single journey. Will you humor me a little bit for a minute, Tor, and close your eyes for a second, and just just take a deep breath, and just really take a moment to put yourself into the shoes of you, the person who was walking out that door that first day. Really put yourself there. And then I want you to kind of come back now and and, and to the best of your ability, can you share who you were 10 years ago and who you are now after this journey? Yeah, so back then I was about 10 years younger. I was highly ambitious. I was set out on what I believe would be the adventure of a lifetime. I thought it was going to be very adventurous and a lot of fun. And I would have loads and loads of amazing experiences and discoveries along the way. And that I would be able to do it in four years or less. Um, at the end of it, I am a battle weary <laughs> old man. I feel much, much older than my skin. And um, I realized after a couple of years that I had imprisoned myself in a highly ambitious project with uh, a very strict codex, which was that I could not fly at any point throughout all of this, that I had to spend more than 24 hours before I could call it a visit in a country. And particularly that I couldn't return home until I reached the final country or quit, which meant that when it stopped being fun after a couple of years, I either had to face quitting and returning home, or I had to push through something which I really didn't have the passion for anymore. And the passion sort of disappeared more and more over time. But yeah, so I'm very happy with who I am today. Very happy with who I am today. I I think I've treated people mostly, uh, treated people well uh, across the entire world. I think I've had something nice to say about every country in the world. I think I've done a good job as a goodwill ambassador of the Danish Red Cross. I think that I have grown into an interesting person and into someone that I would like to spend time with or someone I would like to meet. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy with who I am. And at the same time, if, if we look at what life is and, and we say that, that life is, is basically the accumulation of experiences across time and as you grow older, you have more and more experiences... If you look at the volume of experiences I've had in the past near decade, I really feel like I'm far, far older uh, than just the past 10 years. Um, Yeah. So that's who I am today. (laughs) Wow. I mean, well, what a gift just to even say, well, you know, I'm somebody I'd like to spend time with. I mean, you've spent so much time with yourself. (laughs) Everybody can sort of try their best to visualize the sort of the rigors of the road and people that have you know, traveled enough can kind of try to empathize and put yourself in, in your shoes. But the the sheer magnitude of the goal is really astounding. And the accomplishment, I should say now at, at this point, you know, you mentioned losing the passion and feeling imprisoned by the goal a couple of years in. What, what were those honest conversations with yourself like early on? Like, w- were there some serious moments like, okay, I have to like since seriously consider quitting this right now. What does that mean? What does that look like? Like, what, what were those moments like for you? And I guess what I'm trying to get from this too is, you know, everybody faces challenges like this on a journey, whether you're going a business or, you know, there's all kinds of journeys in life, right? And if you're going for something big like this, sure, you're going to have these moments. Now, I guess I'm just wondering what these moments were like for you. Yeah, well, it, it has been a living hell uh, on and off. Uh, I mean, I, I've come out of this with an enormous amount of good experiences and, and good memories, but there have been really, really tough periods. And the toughest that I've experienced in my entire life was 
going through Central Africa. Um, there were about five or six countries which I expected would take me six or seven weeks to go through. And I ended up being there for seven or maybe eight months. And it is an extraordinarily beautiful and interesting and fascinating part of the world. Um, flora and fauna, food, the people, they really like football and, uh, and, and family and dancing. And there, there's a lot of good to be said uh, from, of, in regards to Central Africa. Unfortunately, it's also a highly corrupted part of this planet. And it becomes a, a near impossible mission to try to accomplish anything. And, and that might be just sending your children to school or certainly anything that requires paperwork. So applying for documents and visas and permissions and getting stamps and signatures was an absolute nightmare, especially because I was not willing to pay any bribes anywhere. So I wanted to run a 100% a uncorrupted project. At the same time, I had decided to do a lot of things within this project. And, um, and I might have bitten too much off, but I wanted to pay a visit to the Red Cross in every country and make a positive profile of the Red Cross and humanitarian work in every country. So I had to reach out to the Red Cross and get in touch and coordinate with them and uh, across different cultures and languages and all sorts of barriers. And often they would not understand what the point was of all of it and that kind of stuff. So that <laughs> became really complex. I wanted to operate social media. I wanted to not necessarily tell people exactly what I'm doing, but tell them something about where I was. And I always wanted it to be interesting or positive. And when I was going through some sort of mental headache, it's, it's hard to talk about how wonderful the world is or how nice people are. So it's, I'm sort of living that duality within myself. And then on top of that, I'm trying to go to every country in the world without flying. And with the mental stress of that, the more time I spend anywhere, the more time passes before I reach back home and that I cannot go home until it's over or go home as someone who quit. So I have to do the paperwork. I have to cross the checkpoints. I have to do this and that. On top of that, I've done speaking engagements whenever people have asked me to. So I've done speaking engagements in 65 countries and more than 120 times around the world. And on top of that, I've done interviews as I went along. And on top of that, I had a long distance relationship. Uh, so there was a lot going on at the same time. And I was trying to operate this monster of a project in sometimes absolutely impossible circumstances. So I did reach a day in late 2015 in the south of Cameroon and near the border with Gabon, where I just couldn't take it anymore. I've been let down so many times. I've been pushed so many times. I've been held back so many times. Everything was just utterly impossible and i didn't feel that like anyone cared i didn't feel like the red cross cared about what i was doing i didn't feel about the world cared about what i was doing i didn't feel about there were any deep conversations with anyone about what was going on or, or why it was truly hard or difficult or demanded a lot of resources the interviews i got would be stuff like what's your favorite food or what's your favorite country and which is also also nice but it, it just really painted a different picture of the accomplishment and, and, and what I was dealing with. And I was looking around me and there's really no appreciation. I didn't see social media growing. It was, I had really small social media. Uh, today, it's still quite humble, but, but, but back then it was really small and it was declining. So, so <laughs> I could sort of measure there's no interest from like, who wants me to complete this journey? Who wants me to go forward in this? Uh, basically, right. like, no why one, am I doing including, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So including myself, I, I just wanted to go home. I just wanted to go back and have a normal life. I wanted to be with my parents and my siblings and my friends and, and, and my now wife, who was my girlfriend back then. Uh, so that's, that's the day where I mentally just threw the towel in the ring and 
I saw a taxi and I decided that taxi is going to take me to the airport and I'll figure out a ticket and I'll fly back home and it will be over. But then eventually I'll have to look myself in the mirror and explain to myself why I, I quit. And you might have all your ducks in a row in, in the situation and maybe also for years to come, but eventually I'm sure I would be looking back and asking myself, was it really that hard? And couldn't you just, and did, did you let the system beat you? You couldn't beat the system. So I ended up not taking that taxi uh, to the airport, but taking the taxi to a different border. And uh, within 48 hours, I was at gunpoint twice. <laughs> and within another 24 hours, I was in a vehicle that almost uh, flipped over. <laughs> so it got a lot worse uh, really quick after that. Wow. So it was really the fear of facing your future self and what your future self would say that drove you away from the taxi cab in that moment. I don't know if it was that profound in the minute or in the moment. I, I think it was more a, they don't know who I am. They don't know who they're dealing with. I, there's no way they're going to get me down. I am going to find a way through this. I will find a solution. I will win. I think it was that kind of thing. I will show them, you know? Yeah, kind of <laughs> embracing the the resolve, like sort of the me against the world mentality to kind of pull you through. And then to follow it up with those moments, uh, oh my, like why, why are you held at gunpoint twice within 48 hours? Uh, the first time was at 4 a.m. in the morning on a dirt road in, uh, in the jungle. So it's pitch dark and the only light is what's coming from the headlights moving forward in front of the vehicle through the dust. And uh, eventually there are three shadows on the road and they stop the vehicle and they're uniformed and they're armed to their teeth and they're drunk out of their mind. And they command us out of the vehicle. And once I come out, they see who I am <laughs> or what I look like. And they just collectively decided that uh, the entire colonialism <laughs> that has been forced upon their country was my fault. And it was a, a horrible, very, very dangerous situation with drunk armed men with their fingers on the triggers that were very, very upset with me uh, for a very long time. So more luck than anything else. There was a little bit of skill in that, of course, but but more luck than anything. I made it out of that. I, th I mean, if, if I was pushed into that situation a hundred times or a thousand times, then it might only be once or twice I would make it out of it. And, but I did make it out of it. And then 24 hours later, even though I had a visa for Congo, which was the country I was trying to enter now, even though I had the visa, even though I had my vaccinations, and even though I had my invitation letter, and even though I had everything, the uh, guy at the immigration didn't want to let me into Congo. And uh, when I started to question politely, politely started to question if he was missing anything, if, if there was something else I had to supply or so and so, he started to get upset. And uh, it's a long story, but, but more people got involved and not everyone was as calm. And then eventually he starts to command me onto a truck so I could head back to Cameroon. And... Uh, and he calls the military over. Uh, so they put guns in my face again. <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't feel my life was really threatened in the same way the second time around. Like these, these guys were not angry. They were more so just following orders. But, but accidents do happen. And then about 24 hours after that, I was in a vehicle with a driver. And the vehicle was packed with people, far more people than you would normally put inside a Toyota. And we're heading down a dirt road really, really fast. And uh, everyone starts to fall asleep. And eventually the only two that are awake are the driver and me. And I see the driver nodding <laughs> and I'm in the back seat. And eventually the driver is out and uh, the, the vehicle just starts to go off the road towards a cliff. And without thinking, I launch myself forward and take a hold of the steering wheel and correct us back up on the road. <laughs> and the driver wakes up and is upset with me because I have my hand on the steering wheel. Uh, but then he realizes 
sort of what happened. And he kind of calmly nods to me like in acceptance. And then uh, he didn't fall asleep beyond that. But I look around in the vehicle and everybody was asleep. Nobody even knew what had happened. <laughs> What's that? That's what in 50 or 60 hours of me mentally giving up on the project, but deciding to push through. So it got a lot worse really fast. And then for the next few months, I was living through hardship, like proper, proper hardship. Uh, and then it got easier. And then things started to work out for me and I could move forward. Yeah, to say things got worse is an understatement, I would say, after everything you just described. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, talk about the universe throwing everything at you. Like you're like ready to give it up. And then all of this stuff happens afterwards. I'm actually shocked that that wasn't the final straw, like even just the first incident. Uh, well, okay. Let's talk about near death experiences then, because those you just described well, the, are near death experiences. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is why I love podcasts because we could talk about this stuff you know, in the realities of this journey, you know, you read an article and it's like, you took 351 buses and 158 trains and all these like, you know, we want the near death experiences statistics. Like <laughs> how many near death experiences <laughs> did you have? No, I'm, I'm making light of it. But, but honestly, like when you go on a journey like this and we're, and we're talking about travel and, and you come back and you're sharing your story and you're in all these interviews, it's like, okay, yeah, you're sharing all these crazy travel stories and adventures from the road and all this stuff. And of course you are, and you've had them. But like some of these things you're describing, other people might describe them as traumatic moments, trauma in life. Like it's not just a travel story to almost be killed at gunpoint. That's a traumatic experience. So I, I kind of want to reframe that because I don't know if you feel the same way or if you just kind of treat it as one of the stories from the road to kind of mentally you know, process or if you've thought about these things, have they been traumatic experiences for you? Yeah, for sure. There are a number of things that have been traumatic for me, but I've been in the thick of it. You know, there is when when this happened, I was around 100 countries uh, from a list of like I was basically halfway. So, you know, it's, it's always wake up and how do happens. I get to the yeah. yeah, like how do I get to the next country? I'm constantly in this tunnel of countries. It's wake up get to the next country, get to the next country, do what's on my list, you know, take a picture of somebody's eyes, take a picture of the sunset, bring one gift from one country to the next, meet with the Red Cross, go to the embassies, get the visas, get my train tickets, work out where am I going to sleep? What am I going to eat? Sometimes do a little bit of me time, like sometimes go to a temple or go to a, a local market or go to a beautiful mountain or something like that. But, but mostly it's just been pushed through. And that's what, when I say that I don't feel that I've had the proper amount of time to reflect over <laughs> the past decade of my life, that, that, that's what I mean. There's, some of this stuff has not had time to surface yet. We are shooting a documentary, which we hope to present to the world next year, 2024. And uh, there's 25 hours of interview material with me at this point where the filmmakers just sat across from me and asked me questions and asked questions and asked questions at 25 hours of interview material. And one thing that we went through several times was this uh, gun episode that I had with the drunken hostile guards. And eventually the filmmaker, he pushed me to a limit where I almost stopped everything. Like I was back in the moment and I was terrified and I had tears in my eyes. And, and you know, he, he called back some emotions and some feelings that I haven't dealt with in, just, that, was, that was just between 2015 and 16. So <laughs> we're talking six, seven, eight years ago, right? Um, in, in another country, I was unfortunate enough to stumble across five dead bodies that were lying on the shore. And, uh, and, and it, I was terrified uh, when I found the first couple of bodies. But then once I found more and more and I found some life jackets and I found some driftwood and some tarpauling and I realized they were trying to cross the ocean and, and go across the Mediterranean Sea to, to safety in Europe. And the, the, the waves and the swell wanted something else and they drowned and they washed ashore. So that gave me, uh, you know, a little bit of calm in understanding what it was that I had been 
observing, but I didn't get back into the water for at least a year after that, just because it was mentally in my head that there are dead bodies floating in the water. And I'm not sure that I've processed that either. There are three of the ships that I've traveled on board that have since been confirmed to be at the bottom of the sea today. And, and I've been on board a number of ships where it has just been Russian roulette. You know, we call them soul sellers. And the reason is because the ships are in such poor condition that when you do get on board, your soul is for sale. And they might make another four or five crossings or another hundred crossings. You just don't know. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to make it across on every account. Sometimes the engine sets out and that kind of stuff. But we've made it across every time. But three of those ships are at the bottom of the sea today. And there are fatalities with two of those ships. So, you know, it's... But we're talking about the negative aspects right now. And I do understand that's interesting. We continue talking about it. I just want to put in a caveat and say... Across the world, people are amazing. Most people are living really calm, ordinary, borderline boring lives with family and food and school and work and traffic. And, you know, for the most part, like at, at the end of the day, I've been through every country in the world on a really small budget. I did it all without flying. So I was on the ground or at sea. And, and you know, I'm alive. I don't have any bullet holes. I My, my head has not been cut off. I haven't been sacrificed to to some religion or strange gods or captured by terrorists or even like people were kind to me. People were good to me. And the few times that things did go wrong, it was usually avoidable. Like I, I with those drunken guys in the middle of the night, I should have been traveling in daytime, right? Like what was I doing there at night? And so on and so forth. Well, I mean, you can always in hindsight look back and say it's one of those things where you can't <laughs> blame the victim, you know, all the time. Just yeah. Because I have questions about kindness and things like that. So I don't pick the wrong. Yeah, idea. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. I just well, I just want it in there because I want people to understand that when I talk about the bad things and the negative things, we can talk about that for hours and hours and hours because it's been a decade. There's plenty of that. But if we're talking about the good stuff, then we have to sit down for several months I wouldn't use the word negative. I would use that this is the reality of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're sharing the reality of it, the whole reality of it. You you need to see the big picture and and on like yeah. you know, it's just easy to take a journey like this and kind of pull out all the all the goodness and the world, you know. Like you're right. If somebody's listening and they're thinking, well, think about the last 10 years of your life and all the different things that have happened. Whether you're stationary and you're going to the same job every day for 10 years, you're still going to have things happen to you, even if you never leave. So over a 10-year period, people are going to deal with ups and downs in life and things like that. Now, of course, I'm not comparing that to what you were doing because it's, it's a lot different, I think, when you're... Well, I mean, I shouldn't say a lot different because depression and these kind of things or, or you know, I'm not saying you went through depression, but, you know, some of these struggles and challenges are part of the human experience and you can experience them at home or, you know, a thousand miles or 10,000 miles from home, but not being able to go home. It's interesting because all of the things that you were describing, it's, it's kind of like this, you're carrying around a lot all the time. And then you have this goal. I'm just wondering how you, from a mindset perspective, how did you balance like kind of trying to be in the moment and enjoy what is your daily life with, you know, the need to kind of like, okay, I got to push through to the next thing because I, I have this goal and I'm going to the next thing and I have to like kind of keep pushing through. Like, how did you do that from a mindset perspective? Did you have days where you're just like, you know what, I'm shutting all this off and I just like, I need this to just not exist for a day and I'm just going to like be here and be present and just be a regular traveler, so to speak. How did you do that? It's a good it's a good question. You know, in in part it's ego driven. So in part it's me telling myself that I'm made of something different. I'm made of the right stuff. I can push through where other people they can't. Like other people would have given up, but I'm special. I can do this, you know, and then reinforcing that, that belief um whether it be true or not just believing in it. Um so that, that's in, in part how I've been able to, to go through it. Uh, I have tried several times to take a break. 
I've tried when I felt like it's it's getting to be too much, then go somewhere nice, uh, find a, a nice hostel or a nice guest house or something like that, and then go and, and, and have three or four days or a week there and just sort of try to disconnect. But I very early found out it doesn't work. Every time I do that, uh, I still wake up facing the same pressure that, you know, an extra week here, even though the, t- it's a, the time is well spent mentally and maybe physically as well, it's, it's a delay. It delays the entire process of getting back home. Like I'm still, every morning I wake up, I'm still waking up to this list, this list that's in front of me that the remaining countries. So I haven't been able to set that aside. Uh, my go-to is to push myself physically. So I've done a number of running challenges and <laughs> hiking challenges and step challenges and that kind of stuff. And, and that helps me. It helps me being physically strong. Um, I like to smoke shisha water pipe. I know it's not healthy for my body, but I do feel like if I can find it somewhere in the world and go and sit there in a corner for myself and I find that that does bring my shoulders down a little bit. And I do like to space out watching a movie. That's one of the things that actually do work for me. Put on a movie and then for an hour and 40 minutes, more or less, I'm somewhere else. Uh, so these are the things that have given me a, a, like a few breaks along the way. I don't know if you've talked about this in, in interviews yet, but you're from Denmark and there is a popular Scandinavian concept called Jantalova talked about it on yeah. the show before. Yeah. Have you talked about this at all in relation to your journey? Not much. Not much. I bring it okay. up myself sometimes, but no. I am a Norwegian citizen now, but not by birth. I, I think it would be better if you explain it. People will understand the question I have around it, which is based on the meaning of it. So why don't, why don't you just uh, really quickly explain what it is, this, this social concept? I don't have any scholarship on this topic, or I'll just sort of like do the children's version of it, which is that it was a book that was written uh, decades ago about a town or a village in Denmark. So it was it was completely fictitious, um, and this society within the town or within the village, they had a certain set of rules which they were upholding, and one of these rules is the most famous one is you should never believe that you're better than anyone else and you should never believe that you're anything you should never believe that you will ever amount to anything like it's these these rules that kind of keep you down and and there are a number of rules so the book was very popular then somehow my country adopted the these uh, rules into society and it's well known across all of Denmark I've lived east center and west in Denmark it's well known that those are our own rules. They are they're not written in law or anything, but these are law just within society. Don't raise yourself above others in Denmark. You know, you, you have to, say, even if you are incredibly skillful, it's better to say that you were lucky. If, if, if you are achieving well above other people, keep your head down. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. It doesn't do well in terms of becoming a top athlete or, <laughs> or a high achiever and this kind of stuff. But it, it does keep people pretty mellow, people uh, pretty grounded. So I, I have a bit of, I'm conflicted. I like it, but I hate it at the same time. I think a lot of Danes feel like that. Well, there's the good side of it, which is I think if I was going to pull out the the thing and distill it down to one word, I would say it's this idea of humble, right? It's like... Being, being humble, I suppose, even though you're a talented artist or a traveler that went to every country in the world or, you know, a best-selling author. But then I agree. The negative side is that, okay, I didn't grow up in a society like this, but is this discouraging talent from being recognized? Because like somebody could hold up a, you know, a drawing that they did and it's like, well, no, you're actually really good at this. Like you're not the same as everybody else. Like, I can draw stick figures. Like I'm not in the same league as you when it comes to art, but I have different talents. This person has different talents. Everybody has their own unique talents. So I'm just wondering, like coming up in this society, I don't know if you always wanted to do something big as a child, if that was something that was like somehow in you, but you didn't know what it was. 
talking about thinking big or just this, this feeling, maybe it is, maybe it's an intuition or maybe it's just a mindset or a combination of both oftentimes to create the reality of, of a goal. But I think I can apply this to, to the listening audience as well, because even if you didn't grow up in Scandinavia, you may be surrounded by people that are keeping you down or everybody's experienced the naysayers. And, or, and sometimes it can be a close family member, like, nah, you could never, you know, you couldn't do that. You're, you're not going to travel around by yourself and, you know, or whatever. And just kind of like putting somebody down when they actually have a goal and they're thinking big, we're talking about a societal construct, but I don't know if there were other people like that in your life, if you got support, but you had that construct in society growing up. Yeah. So I wanted to hear your thoughts around for your own personal journey. When did you kind of realize you wanted to do something bigger how do you sort of think bigger when other people are around you like this or a culture's not designed to support that? Just love your thoughts on some of this stuff. It's, it's, it's a really interesting topic. Just quickly going back to Yentilo, I, 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 I don't think it's as kind as just showing humility. It's, it's about putting yourself down. I think that's what Yentilo is, is about putting yourself down so that others can be raised above you. I, I grew up in the U.S. for a part of my childhood, so maybe I just had enough of U.S. spirit in, in my blood to believe in myself. How old were you? Just to get some context when you were and where were you? Uh, about five. <laughs> I, I was born in Denmark and then within weeks or the first months, we moved to Canada for four years. And then we moved to the U.S. for two and a half years in, uh, in New Jersey. And, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm from so outside I, of Philly. So, you know, we grew up in uh, the same area. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. So I, I grew up with uh, Sesame Street and, and that kind of stuff. And I went to school at the Little Red School House, which was a little barn somewhere and, and learned. Uh, I pledged my allegiance to the flag and that kind of stuff. And then I came to Denmark and then I had all my formal school in Denmark and uh, military career and so sort of yeah, started working and that kind of stuff. And I'd say from an early age, I wanted to take over the world. It was sort of a joke, but a serious joke. You know, I, I really felt like if I could find my, <laughs> my way to take over the world and then be in command of the entire planet and just sort of just stop all the wars and stop all the conflicts and distribute things in the right way. I don't know that I had any real plan for how I was going to do things, but I just had the ambition of doing it. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would be the first master of, the, of planet Earth. And if you ask my siblings, I have two younger siblings, they will be able to confirm this. I must have told them a thousand times that someday I'll be leader of the world and I, I, I will take control. Um, I think that somewhere between getting that idea into my head uh, and, and where I am now, I, I came up with the idea that I am definitely going to be rich. I will be rich and maybe powerful, but I will, I'll be rich. I'll find a way to make a lot of money. I will be a millionaire somehow. And uh, so I, I think I was always driven by these ambitions of being more than average I wasn't always doing better than average, but, but the ambitions were there. I neglected to ask you where you are right now. Are you home? Have you gotten home yet? No, no. So I reached, uh, I reached the final country uh, a couple of weeks ago, almost three weeks ago now. I have returned to Sri Lanka, uh, which was the penultimate country before heading to Maldives. And I'm waiting for a container ship to take me from Sri Lanka to Malaysia. <laughs> and then from Malaysia, I can connect with a container ship that will take me all the way back home to Denmark. So I'm expected to return home at the end of July. How do you feel about that? I, so here's the thing. I've, I've been sick and tired of what I've been doing for the longest time. You know, there, there are a lot of good elements. I've met a lot of nice people. I've had something which never grew old, never grew old. Even to this day, I think it's, it's maybe even better now than it was when I left home, is having conversations with people. I, I think it's amazing to interact with people and have conversations with people. So, so there's a lot of good stuff on that front. But, but 
just being caught in the project has really tormented me for a long time. And it's been such an uphill struggle, especially when the pandemic broke out uh, that I was left with nine countries and I got stuck in Hong Kong for two years <laughs> because of the pandemic. And then the remaining countries for me were pretty much all in the Pacific. And the Pacific was the last part of the world to open up these small island nations. So I was negotiating with governments. I was negotiating with shipping companies. And it was such an uphill struggle for the most part that I was really questioning my own sanity. And I've, people kept asking me, so what's going to happen when you reach the final country? Are you going to fly home or are you going to go home over land and sea? And I really didn't know the answer to that question because I was so over it uh, that I just, you know, if I could go to the airport and be home within a few days, that would be fantastic. But then a couple of months before reaching the final country, uh, the largest shipping company in Denmark, at least one of the leading shipping companies called Maersk, they sent me an email and said, you know what, we have all the, everything is approved. We have all the everything's been signed off on, we can take you all the way home. If you have interest in doing that, we can take you all the way home. And uh, that just changed the game for me. I went like, you know, I, that's really what I want to do. I want to see, I left from home, I want to return home and make it a circle, all of it without flying, you know, that would be great. But I didn't know until I got that email. So it's a completely different emotion that I sit with today. Uh, and the emotion that I have today is I'm on my way home. The, the mission has essentially been successfully accomplished. I did reach every country in the world. I didn't fly at any point. I didn't return home in between. Done. And now I'm on my way home. So it's a pretty good feeling. I'm, I like Sri Lanka. I think Sri Lanka is an amazing country. It's a good place to be. And there's a ship that's going to take me in a few days. That's a sh relatively short voyage. But then the voyage from Malaysia back to Denmark is more than a month. And I think that's going to be good for me to have a routine, have meals, uh, scheduled meals, uh, get the sleep that I need. And that might be when I have some real time to reflect. Right. We talked about you aspiring to greatness and world domination, right? Are, are you, yeah, would, you say yeah. you're, <laughs> would you say you're aspiring to normality now? Mm, yes and no. So I would like to be a professional motivational speaker. I would like to do these speaking engagements at schools and universities. I think you could get a few of those after this. I mean, you've done a little something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope I can, but I, I hope that I'll be able to live off it. So it won't just be that they give me a couple of bottles of red wine that, that I can actually send an invoice afterwards. And... Uh, we have this documentary coming out, which I'm really curious to see how that will be received by the world, because what I've done the last 10 years has been with a lot of smiles and a positive spin on everything. And But there has been this dark side to the project where I've been struggling for a great part. There have been ups and downs, let's say it like that, ups and downs. And the downs have been pretty deep. And the documentary is going to sort of show what did it actually take to accomplish this as a human being? What did it take? So I think it's going to be an eye-opener for a lot of people. It's, it's not going to be a... a tra like, the, the, I haven't seen anything. Like, I'm in the dark a little bit. But the, the, the film instructor, he said, uh, like, after they watch this film, nobody's going to want to try to copy what I did. <laughs> and so with, with, with all of that, with the documentary, and I want to write a book, and I want to do speaking engagements, I don't know if I would ever be able to classify that as normal. But then I would like to have a private life behind all of that, where it is normal, and it's me and my wife and my friends and, you know, some sort of an anonymity. Well, I mean, when I heard about the accomplishment and I was talking to Gunnar, who I mentioned earlier, and he mentioned yeah. you had a girlfriend when you left and now you guys are married and she's your wife. That, that, that was the most surprising thing to me. I said, wait, he's with the same person? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if there was anybody to get you know advice on having a long distance relationship from, I think you are overqualified on this topic at this point. So I know you can only speak to your experience, but 
I mean, there's a lot to unpack on just this topic here. First of all, having the conversations beforehand, I know, you know, let, let me just kind of let people know when you said you thought it would take four years, this isn't just, you know, pie in the sky, somebody who's, you know, naive and didn't do their research. I mean, you come from a professional logistics background. You you were, you know, planning this for many months. So you had a plan and, you know, you, a lot of these things are, of course, completely unforeseen, but you weren't just kind of flying by the seat of your pants, right? I mean, you're like, you, you had like a really solid plan. So when you said you thought it would be four years, you really had that dialed in. Of course, all these unexpected things in a pandemic and, and on and on. So, you know, how did the extension of this affect the relationship? First of all, there's like the sort of the talking about it in the beginning, you know, obviously a wonderful woman to let you kind of go after your goals. But then, you know, things changing, it goes on and on. How how did you, I mean, I get as personal as you want. I don't want to pry too much, but at the same time, this is like a, this is a big deal, man. This is like a huge, I mean, this is your wife. This is like a huge part of your life and you're doing this goal. And, you know, how did you, how did you guys figure that out, man? <laughs> Uh, it is a good topic, and then people joke and say that that could be a book on its own, or that could oh, be a uh, documentary for sure. on its own. Um, we have a very unique relationship. Obviously, we've we've had this monster of a long distance relationship, and it has worked out really well for us. It has not all been good. Obviously, it has not all been good. We've been, we've been fighting. We've been doubtful, and this and that, but. Is it, is it monogamous? Believe... Can I ask? Is it a monogamous yes, it relationship? Because some it people is have monogamous. open. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and then the question is, of course, do you believe <laughs> that, that she has been monogamous? Have you yourself been monogamous? And and I can answer on my own part. I, I know that I have. I've been absolutely faithful and truthful to her. And I feel that I know her as well as I can know that she has returned that as, as well. I do believe we have had a monogamous relationship throughout all of this. She's been out to visit me 27 times across the world. So they say that if you want to test a relationship, then go to Ikea together. <laughs> yeah, it's that's true. She's... That is absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been in Sudan together. We've been in Armenia together. We've been in Jamaica together. You know, like we 27 times around the world, she came out and, and caught up with me. And it, it is we have amazing, unbelievable experiences together as, as a couple from all around the world. Uh, we were together for about a year when I left home. So that makes it even more extreme, right? It isn't like we were together for 15 years or something like that. We were together for a year. She was by my side when I, I, I stumbled upon all of this. And it wasn't like I, I found out that in, in my optics, at least, that no one had gone to every country in the world without flying. And then I said, I'm going to do it. It was just, I, initially I felt I was too old. I, I was 34 years old and my life was somewhere else and I didn't have time to go out and do something like this, right? That's where I was at. But then it just grew on me and, and I started to toy with the idea without wanting to go to every country, just toying with the idea, how would I even do it? What, how would I do it logistically? What would be the route? How much time would I on average spend per country? What would I wear? What would the, be the project name? And then eventually it developed into a project and I got invested. And she was along side for all of that. You know, she, she by no means had the same interest in it as me, but she had an interest in me and, and I was interested in this and she's kind enough to indulge me. So eventually we got to the point where I decided I was going to do it. And we had a conversation and say, what are we going to do? This is going to take maybe four years, three and a half if I go really, really fast, but, but maybe four years, uh, which I thought was realistic based on seven days per country on average. And are we going to do a long distance relationship or are we going to go separate ways from here? And I've been in long distance relationships and, and I know that it, it takes work. It takes effort on both, part, uh, on both parts and it's certainly not always easy. So I was warning her against long distance relationship. And yet she said, we have something good going. Let's stay together as long as it's good. 
So you can leave home and then maybe in two or three months we discover it's not good and then we go separate ways. But it's silly to break something right now, which is still good. And I couldn't, I couldn't argue against the logic in that. And, and, and I love the woman. I love the woman back then. I love her today. So yeah, I, I left and it's a modern world and there is uh, WhatsApp and Skype and uh, internet connectivity and she could come out and visit. And so we thought we had a bright future together and we, it was good for a while. It was good for a long time. And then it got harder and then we, it got really hard. Uh, she was stressed. She was a medical doctor. She's doing a PhD. She decided to do an Iron Man. Like suddenly, she was very focused on realizing her own goals. I was knee deep in Central Africa, as we talked about earlier. I mean, like that took all of my resources. So I wasn't being the best boyfriend at the other end of uh, of the you know phone and. Uh, yeah, we were really struggling to stay updated on what was going on in each other's lives. And, and you know, when, when one says, how are you doing? You say, fine, just because you can't, you don't have time or energy to get into everything. The video call on. fights are the worst, right? Yeah. Because you yeah, can't just yeah, hug. You can't. No, it's <laughs> yeah, not it's a good not scenario. Good. You can't put a hand yeah. on the knee or just be like, you know, come on, let's just, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's tough. But I'll tell you what, we got behind it. So we, we eventually got to a point where we didn't know if we were going to break up or not. And then we decided to have two video calls. We would have one in the morning and one in the evening. And then we had the day to go and think about it. And, and luckily, we were in the same time zone, uh, although separated by great, great distance. So we had the call in the morning and sort of realized that this is make it or break it. And then I was walking around in this neighborhood and I decided, you know, this is the woman. This I want to hold on to her. She's amazing. She is the one for me. She's the one I want to be with. And uh, I sat down and I wrote out a list with 10, 15 or 20 reasons why we should stay together. <laughs> and I emailed it to her and said, uh, we, we can talk tonight. And uh, she liked that. And then we, we spoke in the evening and uh, you know, she was tormenting me a little bit. Go like, I want you to go through the list. What do you really mean with <laughs> so I went through the list. Nice. Good for her. I like her already. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we decided what we had was well worth working on. That uh, I know people, they, they say if it's true love and if it's really good, it shouldn't be work and so on. But I, I mean, sometimes it is work. And especially in a long distance relationship. Uh, so we worked on it and we spent more time and devoted more focus to each other and what was going on in each other's lives. She came out to visit me a little bit more frequently and it got better and it got better and it got better. And then eventually I got on one knee on top of Mount Kenya and uh, presented her with a ring and she said, yes. And then we figured, you know, I'm going to be home in a couple of years. Um, we'll, we might get married in, in Australia or New Zealand or somewhere along the, the way uh, or when I get back home. And then uh, it got delayed. And then I was stuck in Hong Kong for two years and I couldn't leave Hong Kong and she couldn't get inside Hong Kong, except if I was married to her and if I was a resident within Hong Kong. So I got a job in Hong Kong and we found out that there's an agency in Utah which marries people online. And we got married online so she's married on december 19th and i'm married on december 20th because of the time difference and we tried to process this in denmark and in denmark they you know that does not compute like you're definitely not married that was basically the answer we got like you you have to be in the same room you cannot get married online you're not even in the same time zone like that's ridiculous but it was good enough in hong kong so now she was able to get her visa and then travel and quarantine for three weeks at a hotel in Hong Kong. And then we were together for about 100 days in Hong Kong. So that it, it worked. Uh, then the next thing was, because we were not married in Denmark, we still wanted to get married properly. And uh, eventually, beyond Hong Kong, and I was moving through the Pacific a few years later, she came to visit me in Vanuatu. And we found out that we could get married in Vanuatu. And we had a proper, really, really nice, very, very funny wedding uh, with a few people near the ocean. And 
And she said yes to me again. And we signed the paperwork. And then this German woman, and Germans are generally known for being accurate and precise and efficient and all this stuff. So we had so much trust in her. And I still do. I have a lot of trust in her. She would take the paperwork and process it on our behalf. And then we both left Vanuatu. I left on a ship and she got on an airplane. And then the government in Vanuatu, they had an online attack, ransomware attack. So all their computers and all their devices and all their information was locked. And this took a long time for them to start to make their way out of it. And then when they started to make their way out of it, they were hit by one of the hardest uh, typhoons that they've been hit by in five or in 10 years. And then just within a few days, hit by another typhoon. So suddenly they, uh, <laughs> yeah, suddenly they were busy with other things. So we're not married in Denmark, but here's what we know. We're married in Utah. We're married in Hong Kong and we're married in Vanuatu. A couple things just to pull out of that. First of all, I, it's, what an accomplishment. I say this may be even be a greater accomplishment than the, than the travel is just staying together through all this. That's incredible. Also, and this idea of like, you know, letting each other go and then kind of revisit. I like that philosophy of just kind of, hey, do we, you know, if, as long as this is good, why end it? But you never want resentment to be built up because somebody didn't get to do something they wanted. That That's always a recipe yeah. for disaster. But I think that was really a big part of her uh, thinking that she was worried about if I would sit for the rest of my life wondering and thinking I could have had this great adventure or this huge accomplishment, but she held me back how that would work out. Sure. Because if you're looking at the big picture, that that could ruin everything, right? Like, yeah, yes, 10 years could. is a huge chunk of time, but if you're talking about being married for 40, 50 years... We didn't know it's, it was going to be 10 years. You know? Right, exactly. And, and yeah. you know, so here's, here's how it works. You know, I, I got close to four years and absolutely knew I wasn't going to accomplish it in four years, but thinking it might be four and a half years or it might be five years. So you just stretch the, <laughs> you just stretch it a little bit and then you go maybe five and a half years and then maybe six years. Yeah. And then you yeah. know, eventually you go global pandemic and you say, well, it's not my <laughs> fault. We're all locked yeah. in this <laughs> pandemic. You know, we're all, we all have to be somewhere. And, uh, and then you go to what, yeah. how can I, how can I run away from it now? There are only eight countries left. There are only five countries left. You know? Right. Yeah. It just kind of happens she's, in real time. Yeah. It's hard to. She's very yeah. proud of me. We're very good at communicating. We're very, very good at um, we're very good at being a couple. I think. I mean, like we we sort of feel like we've grown closer in spite of the distance, which is unique. It will be really interesting to see how you guys are as a couple in a sort of yeah. what's called a regular couple setting, right? Because it's a different yeah. dynamic. You know, another thing this story reminded me of is that you can take care of almost anything from the road nowadays like never use it as an excuse right i mean even though you guys were apart and you're not married you found a way to get married online and still come together through all this craziness so it's like you know don't ever use like oh i can only do this you know i can't go anywhere because i have to do this thing it's like it's it seems like almost everything is possible online right now even things you never would think are There you have it. Thanks again to Thor. And we will pick up there in a couple days as a reminder. Part two will come out on Thursday. I don't want you to wait too long for it, but thought it would be good to break this one up so we had time to digest the conversation. In the meantime, if you want to learn more, onceuponasaga.dk. And I'm going to leave you with a challenge, something that I've been pondering since this conversation that, that may shift the way you approach a future goal, a future decision. And it's a simple question. It's kind of where everything starts, if you think about it. And you don't complete a quest like this without having the initial idea in the first place. And you can't really have an initial idea this big if you're not thinking big. So my question is, what would it look like if you thought bigger? And I encourage you to play with that. I'm doing the same. Take a look at a goal or something you're working on right now and just ask yourself that question. What would it look like if I was thinking bigger about this, if I thought really big, how would that change it? Would it change it? Use it as a thought experiment. And I'm going to do the same. And just wondering where that leads you. So in the spirit of all thinking bigger together, I'll leave you with that. 
as well as this quote from Richard Branson, who said, if people aren't calling you crazy, you aren't thinking big enough. (laughs) I think that's appropriate to wrap this one up. Thanks for listening and see you again in a couple days. Peace and love to you and yours. Cheers. This podcast has been brought to you by zerototravel.com. Ideas and advice 